Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank my friend Bob for inviting me to participate at this uh, event. It's, and uh, this is really the, the diehards who have hung around uh, that don't want to leave the party. You know the type. Uh, I don't know. Somebody will, be, somebody will be in this room at 4.15 going, Hey, can we get a cup of, cup of coffee around here? Uh, um, so uh, I want to thank Steve for picking me up at the airport. And he's right. We, it's funny how we sort of dovetail into each other's experiences. And uh, uh, when you get a little time, you don't dovetail into the negative ones, which is really pleasant. And we had a great conversation and a good time. And I felt more than welcome the whole time here. I have a lot of people here that I know, a lot of friends. I want to thank my friend Bruce from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, for getting me a cup of coffee this morning. I've been up since 3, 3.30 this morning with an allergy attack uh, that has just been, you know, you just think that you're going to feel good, and uh, well, this is going to be your problem, not mine. Um, <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about the 12th step. I don't have any. I don't have my big book. I packed it, and then I swore that I was not going to unpack that damn bag to get the big book out. So I'm going to wing it this morning. Uh, also, as a caveat for people, I I love people who can go through the book and quote passages from it. I love that. I can't do that. I can't remember anything. I can't, no, it's not, that's not funny. Um, although I just forgot why. But I, I, um, I don't know what happened, but when I was in high school, uh, I was able to recite long passages and enjoy things. And I, I taught uh, high school English and college English for a while, sober. And uh, I love Shakespeare, and I love the great poets, and I would love to be able to commit those things to memory. And I can't—I taught for years, and I can't remember a thing. Uh, I can't for, from memory. I can't pull out a Shakespearean sonnet to use because I don't remember them. But the good side of that is that it all seems so new every time I pick it up. It's just, <laughs> wow, this stuff is great. And that's how I feel about the big book, and I guess that's a blessing because every time I read the big book, which is often. Uh, not as often as, as you would think, but uh, uh, often. And I read that and go, this is good stuff. This is really, I've done that. I do that. And, and oh, I probably ought to do that. Um, but I'm supposed to talk to you about the 12th step. And honestly, uh, this whole weekend has been a, a living, breathing, fluid, evolving experience of the 12th step happening right around you. There's really nothing I can do to enlighten you as to how to do the 12th step. I know that if you look at the big book, and and I'm stepping out on a limb here, um, (laughs) the the reason I remember this is because it's, it's great. The 12th step in the big book, the working with others chapter, is, is like an app before apps ever came to anyone's mind. It's like a computer program of how to work with newcomers. Try this. If they don't like that, do this. If they balk, do this. If they don't balk, go here. And it's, it's fascinating to read pages of what to do. Ah, they don't do that? Try this. It's, it's like a recipe book. You just keep going through. And then you go to do it, and, it, and everything falls apart, really. You just kind of wing it. You don't know what to do. I, uh, I was cowed. I, I have to tell... Uh, I, I'm, I'll have to qualify for a second. I love alcohol. I always have. I have no resentment against alcohol. It just is, uh, uh, like Clancy likes to say, it's an, an old, like an old girlfriend. You know, you, she was something back then, but not much to look at now. But I, uh, uh, <laughs> actually, there's an empty seat right there where Clancy ought to be. We, we rolled the stone away from his room this morning, and the room was empty. <laughs> So, 
So he is risen. Um, anyway. Um, my first 12 step call. Well, I was still talking about. It. I, I'm going to go all around because really, what's going to, what can I lose? I'm leaving right after this. So, um, my drinking did for me what it, the same thing it did for every other person who was up here. I didn't like the idea of it because when I was, I didn't drink till I was 18. I'm kind of a late bloomer in a lot of areas of my life. I have, I have two very young children because I started having children at 50. Uh, which is good because the good side of that is I didn't start later. Uh, I could still at 50 throw them in the air and catch them, you know, and, and now it's one or the other pretty much. Uh, you can't have, <laughs> you can't have both. <laughs> I'll throw you in the air, but somebody else is going to have to back it up for me. I, uh, I'm done with that, but I, um, so at 18, uh, I, I, I grew up in the 60s. I was in the middle of it. I was, you know, I was born in 1950. I was I graduated from high school in 1968 at 17, and I got right in. I went right into college and uh, graduated from college, and in, in, well, 13 years later. But uh, um, but I, I was I was a kid who had a good family. I had good parents. I had a community that I grew up in. I went to Catholic church every week. My mother made sure I was. I had a an education in religion and my father always supported that although he was a methodist so he just dropped us off and left and uh, uh my my father's family my my forebears are from the tundra of fargo north dakota and uh we we're just tough tough uh irish slash pennsylvania dutch types and uh speaking of pennsylvania i'm glad you found your home group down there in mexico uh <laughs> hey, guess what? They're decorating for Christmas. <laughs> There's heads on every light post. Uh, uh, it's, um, but we, um, we, I grew up in a good community where people were kind. I was taught manners. I had to have manners because my father had been a drill instructor in the Marine Corps for eight years. I think he would have scared the shit out of Frank Jones, uh, personally. But, um, anyway, uh, but I had I had a set of values that were impenetrable. I believe that some people believe that laws are written for other people. I believe that laws are written to be obeyed all the time, no matter what. And if you don't if you park where it says no parking, someone should beat you senseless and so that you will never do that again that's the kind of standards i had uh yeah, there's right and there's wrong there's just right and wrong i and i didn't like my generation because i didn't like people i really still i find myself struggling to be fond of of my species but i um i didn't like them and the problem that i have with not liking people is I also demand their approval all the time. So I hate the human race and I need it to validate me and I hate the human race but love me. And that, you know, after a while all it does is just build up torque in your life. It just keeps you moving forward, that bouncing back and forth. And um, and so I, uh, I, I got out of high school and went right into the music industry as a, a clerk in a record store and I was working there when these guys... Um, came to the store and invited me to a party. And I had never been to a party because, as I understood it, there would be people at the party. That didn't seem, doesn't seem bad to most people, but I just, I would rather have, go to a party where there just aren't any people. You know, really. You, you can, a lot of people here can probably track that. And uh, so I said, okay, I didn't really want to go. I say okay to things. I, and I, okay, I'll go to the party. Yeah, great. And um, so I've got my best buddy. And he drove, and we went to this party in Santa Ana, California, and uh, it was everything I thought it would be. It was horrible. It was horrible. It was like 200 kids in this Victorian house, 1968. I just turned 18 years old. Half the room is drunk. Half of them are on acid. 
they're all believing they're having a conversation somewhere in this. And I'm standing off to the side, and I have, I'm just looking at them going, my father would be so disappointed to know that I'm here. My parents would hate the thought that I'm standing here with all these hippies. Now, I love rock and roll, but I hate hippies. And um, because they're full of crap, that's why. Because they talk that 1960s philosophy 101 rubbish that is just chitter, chatter, chitter, chatter, chitter. What, you know, what was the last book you read? Let me recite lines from it for you. And I hated them. I hated them. Because I read a lot of stuff and I wasn't hip at all. I was a goofball. I was six foot two, 127 pounds of percolating testosterone. Uh, and, and I was not happy to be there. And they're going on and on and the women are dancing around, you know, like they thought Judy Collins might if she was there. And, uh, it was really, it was, it was hard to watch. And, um, and I'm standing off to the side of the room, and I'd been there five minutes, and I thought, you people are a bunch of miserable, ferret-faced little bastards. I don't want to be around you. I don't like you. I don't like what you stand for. I don't know what you're doing with your life, and I really find this completely pathetic that I'm even standing here, and, uh, which I felt the first meeting I went to, too. It was an interesting bookend, but, um, uh, but the, this guy walks by, and he hands me a can of malt liquor, you know, because I'm... I'm one of the people. It's the people's malt liquor. And uh, I'm standing there with this can of malt liquor, and uh, I thought, what, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I'd rather have a soda or something. I, I've never had a drink before. And I'm, oh, God, this is, God, I hate this. I cracked a can of malt liquor and started drinking it, and I just got about halfway through that can of malt liquor when it occurred to me that I'd been way too hard on you people. <laughs> that you were somehow getting better and cooler, and more attractive to me. Uh, the albumen that kept me separated from you, that, that kind of, that, that stuff that no matter how you push on it to try to get through it, you can't, I couldn't experience life, I guess, just disappeared. And there I was. I was, I was there. And that's the only way I can descri- describe what alcohol did for me, was that when I drank... I wasn't in Charlie's head anymore. I was there. I wasn't worried about what happened yesterday, and I'm not afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. Because I, when I drank, am a very fine hybrid of John Lennon and Errol Flynn, David Niven, Neil Armstrong, all swirled around in this really great concoction. I don't know, you know, if that ever could come off. It's hard to pull that off when you look like Sherman from the Mr. Peabody cartoons. But uh, I knew that my time is coming, certainly. And I, I drank that way. I drank until I had another can of malt liquor because I wanted to stay there. I don't want to go back wherever it was that I had been from. I wanted to stay there. And uh, I wound up going into a blackout that evening and running alongside of my friend's car because eventually he wanted to leave. And I didn't. And I was hanging onto his door handle and vomiting all over myself and just laughing my ass off because I'd been there. And once you've been to the mountaintop, there's no going back. There's just no going back. I would never, and that, I think that's probably the cheat of alcoholism is that um, once you and I experience what it's like to be there, do you ever want to be anywhere else? Do you ever want to feel the way you felt 10 minutes before you found, discovered where there is? I don't. And the thing that really is remarkable is that if I stay away from AA for too long, I'm going to forget that I'm an alcoholic. But I've been away from a drink for 30 years, and I've never forgotten where there is. I always, that's always filed in the back of my mind. And I think that's what kills people like you and me, because... When I am in the worst of the way I feel as an alcoholic about other people and about myself and about everything that Sheldon talked about, which was brilliant, about the, the, just the, how we can turn, we can just curdle the milk on any situation, really. Uh, it's, it's a knack, I think, that most of us have. But when that happens, and when I'm sitting in a meeting, and this has happened to me before, I'm sure there are a couple of people here this has happened to, where you're sitting in a meeting, and you're looking around the room, and you're going, oh, I get it. Oh, yeah, it's like a big pyramid game. 
You know, I get what you, I get it now. I can see this nonsense. This is all a big facade. You're all phonies, you know. And the minute I think that, I have been around here long enough to know that I need to talk to somebody. I need to go do something. Uh, thank God for that. And um, But that's what alcohol does for me. And it never got any better than that. My drunk log is tedious, boring, won't waste time with it. I've never come out of a blackout yelling, you know, cut the red wire. Um, <laughs> or uh, somebody cover me, I'm going in. Uh, never. Uh, I recall people saying things to me when I came out of a blackout, like, uh, boy, I bet that hurt. <laughs> because um, I'm, a, uh, I'm an alcoholic who surrenders to gravity more than anything else, and, uh, and I have the scars to prove it. And that's how my drunk log went. I mean, I, it's a series of... It's like a pinball machine with most of us, you know. We just bounce from one bad experience to another. It lights up, it ding, 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 and then we bounce into the next one, ding, 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 and we go in the gutter and drop and disappear, you know. And uh, that's pretty much, there we are. Um, and if you're new, welcome to AA. Uh, I suspect this is not your best autumn. Um, the holidays are coming. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. (laughs) Anyway, so I wound up, uh, I had a sister-in-law. I I got married to a woman that I loved. Trust me, an alcoholic's love is different from other people's love. And I don't need to, I'm not going to, this is not a relationship seminar. I, uh, I think you've heard enough about most people, especially Ralph, jeez. Uh, but, um, but this, uh, I married this woman, I was 25 years old. Uh, the only real flaw in that relationship was that she loved me. She really loved me. She was an alcoholic. And she tried to drink like me. She tried a couple of times, which is really, if you really want some interesting, uh, an interesting way to spend an afternoon, watch non-alcoholics drink. It's really pathetic. It's like watching a eunuch uh, watch a porno movie, I guess. I don't know. But uh, <coughs> alcohol, a non-alcoholic, she used to sit with me and she'd go, hey, I'll drink with you because she didn't want me to leave the house. Because I, I left the house, I left our hotel room on our honeymoon to go drink. I know that's bad form. But at the time, I didn't know I'd be here, but I just would tuck her into bed and say, I'm going to go out and get a few drinks, and I'll be back in a little bit. And I would close the bars, and she'd be back at the hotel, a new bride with a husband who was out drinking. I can't, you know, I made amends for that, but I don't know why. The mindset now, as a, as a 60-year-old man in a successful marriage, it's appalling to me. But that's just, that's what happened. And so I was married to her, and she had a brother named Bob. And Bob had been in detoxes and sanitariums. This is back in the early 70s, mid-70s, and and different places. They didn't have a lot of uh, alcoholic recovery facilities. They didn't have any rehabs back then uh, to speak of. And so Bob came over one time. He he had been sober. He hadn't had a drink in a while. And he came over to our apartment, and um, I was happy to see him. I bought a quart of Jack Daniels. And uh, I love I love a good phlegm cutter after work. You know what I mean? That one, you know the one where you just fire it back and it makes you go, <coughs> and just it kind of it just radiates everywhere and makes me feel so uh, so relieved, so there. And and so Bob came over and we started drinking. And about a half we were listening to music and chatting and yak and having a good time. And I couldn't believe because it was really the second time I'd met him, I couldn't believe all the stories she'd been telling me about him. You know, you hear something about somebody, and then you go and meet them, and they're completely different from what you heard. She said that he was an alcoholic, you know, and I'm having the greatest time with this guy. We're in a conversation. We're connected. And she, I look over, and she's by the bedroom door doing this, which is men know this is not the sign that you're about to get a compliment. You know, it's, that, it's like when you slap the newspaper against your leg to the dog. And... Uh, 
So I, I go into the, I, I excuse myself and politely went into the bedroom and she shut the door and said, stop giving Bob alcohol. Bob is an alcoholic. And I said, Bob is no more of an alcoholic than I am. <laughs> the problem here is that you are a nag and you need to back it up, sister. We're just trying to have some fun. I walked out, and I, she's sobbing in the bedroom, so we just turned the music up a little louder and, uh, um, and had a great time. And, uh, and the capper to this is that two weeks later, he was dead. He drowned in Lake Castaic. He went out, he went out with some friends and, and was drinking all day, and he went out to swim in the lake, and he never came back. You know? And we didn't talk about alcohol then. Nobody talked about our drinking or my drinking or anything. It was silence and fear, you know. And um, so fast forward about eight years, and Bob had left a five-year-old daughter and, and a, a wife that he had been estranged from. And I I had gone to a meditation retreat. I'd been in therapy for a couple of years. It wasn't going really well, but... Um, the woman had told me not to show up smelling of alcohol or she wouldn't treat me. And um, I'd been peeing blood at the time and was having some problems with irregular visits to the emergency room and uh, being given, you know, drugs to try to help with my problems. They gave me, you know, Valium to help counteract my stress, which to me is really stupid. I mean, I I took Valium, and you drink on top of Valium, and it's like watching a space launch, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 8, 6, 3, 2, and nothing happens, and you sit there, I'm, wait, you know, and I'm sitting on the couch with, wanting to get there, but, you know, I can't get the damn gate open, and, um, you sit around for about four hours sighing, <laughs> but I, you know, um, I see this is the this is the distinction I this is the problem I have with drugs because I took them, I took them uh, I took PCP once, just to be polite, and um, <laughs> someone offered it to me in the back of a van. You know, are you, are you, this is great, with, with uh, you know, Black Sabbath playing, and I'm in the back of the van smoking this PCP, and I started to hallucinate a little bit. Um, and I realized, uh, I'm, I went, they took me into the bar, and I'm sitting at the bar, and I, had a, I put my head down on the bar. I hadn't even had a beer yet, and I, I, I could see, with, even with my eyes closed, I could see my eyes sliding down my neck, <laughs> sitting in my chest cavity, looking up, and seeing light shining through the eye sockets and, and thinking I can never get out of here. I can't. And they finally, the bartender said, you gotta get your, you gotta get this guy out of here. You know, uh, he's, he's killing the mood in this, uh, I guess, <laughs> I guess the crying didn't help, but, um, And it occurred to me later on, after being sober for a while, that I really don't need to induce psychosis. Um, I just need to stop drinking for a little bit. I get real, real jumpy and sketchy. But I took these things, and the problem I have with drugs is drugs get me loaded, you know. And I don't want to be sitting around smoking a bag of marijuana, and how many times in a row can you listen to Foghat do free ride before you're in the kitchen eating ketchup packets, you know. <laughs> Uh, or, or you know, noshing on a bullion cube. That's um, because it's crunchy and it tastes like chicken. That's the rationale that goes around in your head. Uh, but drugs, drugs got me loaded. But what I wanted to be was not loaded. I wanted to be there. And drugs never got me there. Alcohol did always. And that's why I'm an alcoholic. Once I stopped taking the Valium, I didn't care if I ever took it again. Once I had these experiences, I really didn't care that much. I could smoke pot intermittently and not really care. It didn't bother. I didn't. 
sit around going, gee, I wonder when the next time is I can do that. But when I drank, I had to drink, and I had to keep drinking. I didn't know why. I just had to go until the last, till the last gasp, whatever that was going to be, whether it was passing out in a restroom at some public place or waking up in the ivy with my, my friend's mom walking by going, hey, you know, there's spiders in the ivy. <laughs> and, uh, and I learned a lesson from that. I never slept in ivy after that. Um, I don't want to be around any spiders. But we, we rationalize all these things. And so I wound up at this therapist, and... Um, and she really tried to help me. She was a wonderful woman, a really just a beautiful soul. Uh, her name was Daisy, and she was a, as a child, she'd been in the concentration camps with her parents. And um, she was so attuned to me, and I didn't understand what was happening to me in there. But I, apparently, in retrospect, I can see that things were coming to an end. Uh, I had cut away my parents. I cut away my friends. I cut away every good thing in my life and just moved off from it and couldn't get any balance on what was happening in my life. And I was, I wanted to be a writer. And by this time I was in the publishing business. I was working as a, I was a receiving clerk at a bookstore. And, um, <laughs> and it was, I'd been there for a long time, years and years, which was sort of a stepping stone job. But it took a little bigger stone than I had, but I, I was ready for. And so uh, she tried to help me. And she couldn't. She asked me if I'd come to a meditation retreat with her, and I went to the meditation retreat. And at the meditation retreat, uh, I was asked at, at a certain point on the Saturday afternoon. Now, now my car was hemmed in, and it was stacked parking at this place, and I couldn't get my car out. And I started to detox because I'd been out the night before, and I went to the meditation retreat, and I didn't get any. I was driving up there, and I went to get something to eat, and the woman said, "You want a drink with that with your dinner?" And I said, "No, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm fine right now." Because I didn't want to get drunk on the way up there because she said she wouldn't treat me. But I knew it was at a Catholic retreat place up in Montecito. I knew they would have wine. Catholics, wine, you know, uh, of course. So I get up there and uh, I park my car and everybody else pulls in, you know, the next half hour they're packing it in. And, and she said, would you like something to drink? And I said, yeah, I'll have a glass of white wine. And she said, she laughed. And she said, we don't need wine up here. How about, how about some herb tea? And I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was like, what? In, uh, not, even, not even real tea where you can really kind of at least get something out of it. But herb tea, there's nothing to it. You know, and uh, I said no. And I went through, I started a detox that night. And the next day we had a guided meditation during which I thought about my own suicide. Um, which I mean, seemed funny in retrospect, but it wasn't funny then. And, uh, and so I went out on the grounds. She sent us out to the, the meditation grounds. You know, I want you to walk around and, and commune with... Again, it was beautiful, a beautiful place. And these nuns ran it, and it was just lovely. It had rose gardens everywhere. And um, I went way out, as far away as I could get, and I thought, I'm going to kill myself. Not because of any drama, because I've always thought of killing myself. But uh, I just want to be. Out. I just want to be out of here. I just want to be gone. You know, I don't want to be. I don't want any drama. I don't want any big fanfare or flair. I just would wish God would just kind of take me and pull me out of this life because I've screwed it up. I'm almost 31 years old. I've blown every opportunity I've had. I owe everybody I know money. I owe every credit card money. My marriage has failed. I can't. I can't even keep the little house that I'm living in. My, I'm living in my parents' house, the one I grew up in. And my mom had remarried after my father died, and she was living with her husband. And um, and I was and I kept the house and stayed in there. And it was 120 or some dollars a month mortgage payment, and I was about four months behind on that because that's a lot of scratch to pull together when you're a uh, when you're a drinking alcoholic. And and so I'm up at this retreat, and I just wanted to die. And I sat there, and I got all of a sudden this sense. And it sounds hokey, but this, this is my experience of being loved from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, absolutely thoroughly loved in every fiber, in every cell of my body for about 30 seconds. I felt radiant and alive and full of joy, and I didn't know what was happening. And then it finally just snapped off. It went away. And I thought, I'm losing my mind. This is what's happening. 
And what I heard inside when that happened was, uh, you're everything that you're afraid of, and I still love you. And I didn't hear it as a voice. I just sensed it inside. And I, I walked away from that, and I went back to this, the main house where they were doing the meditation, the main area, and I just sat there. I was stunned. I sat out there and cried for about three hours before I kind of staggered back to this house and sat down and had dinner with people. And I just went back to my room and laid on this bunk because I was the only guy there. And uh, I had the bunk house all, all to myself. And I laid on that bunk and just shook and cried and shook and cried and then left there and I went home. And that was the 11th of June of 1981 and I haven't had a drink since then. I haven't had anything. And I, it's not that I didn't want a drink because the next week was really difficult because I had a bachelor party for a friend of mine and I bought all the booze for it. And I didn't drink, and I white-knuckled it. And that is the most painful experience I've ever had of watching other people get there. And I struggled because I thought, if I drink, I'm going to wind up just like I was right before, right when I was at, the med- at that meditation retreat. I'm going to wind up that way again. I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm having these auditory hallucinations. I'm having the physical ones. I'm having the, And they're not bad, but I don't want to do them again. You know, the, the gnats that gather in your peripheral vision that you go to look at and they're gone, you know, and then you go back to talk to whoever you're talking to and they, they come back and, and so the only alternative you have is to brush them away. And, um, so, so I, um, I get a call from my soon-to-be ex-mother-in-law, and she, and this woman really loved me too. A lot of people, I know a lot of people have come into AA and they have, brutal stories where no one loved them. They could not, They had absolutely no one that showed any affection or concern for them at all. And mine was quite the opposite. I came to AA and people loved me and I couldn't stand it. I couldn't, be, it's not that I couldn't stand it, I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear to receive other people's love because I didn't know what to do with it and it was torment and, and it was, I rejected it at every turn. My own parents, my friends, everybody. And um, so my mother-in-law called me and she said, Hey, um, Debbie, who is Bob's widow, is getting out of a detox on, um, on Sunday. Can you take her to an AA meeting? She just needs a ride. And I told her, well, you know, I quit drinking this week. And she said, oh, that's good. That's great. Because she asked me before if I thought I had a, a drinking problem. And I told her, of course, no. Um, I have a supply problem. I have a drinking problem. Um, but she, she said, can you give her a ride to the, this, I'm not, I'm not getting emotional. I've got an allergy thing going. Um, so she, she was getting out of this, uh, orange, this place in orange, this care unit. And I picked her up and I bravely drove her in my beat up Volkswagen. By all rights, this woman should have been driving. And she had 22 days of sobriety. And, uh, We drove there, and in the 20 minutes or so that it took to get from where I picked her up to the meeting place, she 12-stepped me. I didn't know it. She didn't tell me anything about AA. She didn't tell me anything about the big book. She didn't tell me anything about steps. She didn't tell me anything about any of that stuff. What she told me was, hey, I said, how are you doing? And she goes, really well. I've been going to three meetings a day. I've been learning. I've been taking, I took an inventory in there. And I'm starting to understand that there's something better in, for my life. And I looked at her, and she was different. She looked different. Not just looked different. She looked different, like, from the inside out. Something about her that had changed in 22 days. And I would tell you, if you're 22 days sober or know somebody who's 22 days sober, that's not too early to work with somebody else. Because that lady's 22 days saved my life. Saved my life. And so don't ever... Don't ever underestimate the the power of just a few days of sobriety because it's beyond my ability to help, to alter anyone the course of anyone's life, but it is within my ability to provide a beacon of hope if I can to show them that they're welcome. And we pulled up in front of that meeting, and she said, uh, "I said, what time do you want me to pick you up?" And she said, "Well, why don't you come into the meeting with me?" And I thought. I didn't think I said it to her. I said, I'm not alcoholic. Really? And, um, <laughs> and now, it's, mind you, it's getting dark out, and I've got sunglasses, and I've got a Sherlock Holmes hat, 
and shoulder length hair. I got this mustache that was my last connection to John Lennon. And, um, and I'm sitting in this car brushing away imaginary gnats. And I told her I'm not an alcoholic. And you know what she said? If she didn't say anything, like try to convince me, she said, that's okay. It's an open meeting. You don't have to be an alcoholic. Anybody's welcome. And since you quit drinking this week, um, maybe you'll hear something that'll help you. And wow, that just seemed fair. It just seemed, it was able to get past all of my, my screen of resistance to help from people that were kind to me. And so I parked the car and I went inside and oh my God, I walked in there and thought I was in Loserama. And um, people were running up and giving me cards and hi, call me anytime, you know, good to see you, you keep coming back. First things first, welcome, get you this. I thought, oh, no, 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 I don't. I didn't say that. I just went, hi, you know, and um, and uh, they got me a big book. Not just a big book, but in, at that place, they called it, they talked about it in this tone. Hey, Charlie, you got a big book? Because when you get sober in Orange County, you get a little twang. I don't know why. You could be talking like this. Like I do, and wake them up in the middle of the night, they talk like this. But when they get sober in Orange County, they start getting that kind of stuff. I don't know where it comes from, you know. Um, and, and you got a big book? Get you a big book. You know? And all I'm thinking is, you know, what are you talking about? A big book? How big a book do you mean? Um, does it have a title? Maybe. Or is that how you label everything around here? You know, brown drink. Uh, so I went up and got the big book. And um, Debbie, Debbie was all excited. You know, I got it. You know, I got it for three dollars credit. And um, I had three. I had three bucks in my hand. It was a five dollar big book. And this, this is something important. It has nothing to do with the twelve step, but it might. It might. I say it does. And um, I'm holding out the money, and she said, I said, I can't afford it. I've only got three bucks. I'll come back next week and get it, which is like, well, it's like I'll circle around and I'll pick it up later, Charlie. And so I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, but I'll come back next week, and I'll get it then. That's all right. I don't need the book right now. No, no, no. Take the book. Take the book. Look, don't feel bad about taking the book. Just take the book. And I'll take your, I'm going to take these $2 because I have my hand out. I'm going to take these $2. And, and that book is yours. You don't have to pay for the rest of it. We're happy that you have it. If you want to pay it back, great. If you want to buy somebody else one, that's great. But you just keep the book, and the $2 is more than enough for it. And that other dollar you got in your hand, I want you to save that for the basket because nobody stays sober around here on somebody else's dime. And I thought, okay. So I sat down with my dollar, and I put it in front of me so I wouldn't forget. You know how we are? We just get so self-conscious at certain things when people give you direction. Um, I like to pre- keep my anonymity, but I, I remember being at a, at a daddy and me thing with one of my son one time. They have mommy and me, and then on one Saturday a month they have daddy and me in Burbank, and so I go to daddy and me, and it's all the, there's like 29 guys there with their kids, and we we go in the facilitator's uh, room, and she uh, sits us all down, and we're all around this big table, and she says, okay, I want you to go around the table and tell us your name and tell us what you do. I hate that. I hate that, because I know I'm going to say my name's Charlie and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I know I'm going to say that, and if you, I got, I'm so self-conscious, I'm, and they're going, and guys, going, my name's Jeff, and I'm, I'm a, a writer, and my name's Jack, and I'm a plumber, and they're going around the table, and it gets to me, and I go, my name's Charlie, and I write for a living. And I thought, oh, thank you, God, thank you, God. <laughs> Blow my enemy. Two people down, this guy goes, my name's Tom, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and four of us went, hi, Tom. So you can't escape us, really. Um, then at the coffee break, we're going, really, you? <laughs> um, so I, I went home from that meeting, and I, I, I didn't drink that week. I didn't go to a meeting that week either, because I thought AA met on Sundays. And um, eventually, eventually I got a sponsor because people were working with me and I didn't even know it. Uh, a woman named, I went to my first Pacific group meeting. I'd, and I'd, I'd gone to this meeting. I went to the next week meeting because Debbie got a 30-day chip. 
as they describe it, a, a chip. Not just a chip, but a chip and a hug. You get a chip and a hug if you get 30 days. And she told me that. She said, Charlie, if you stay sober for 30 days, you get a chip and a hug. And I thought, well, nothing could make me come back more than a chip and a hug. Uh, can you slip a 10 or something in there? Uh, then I'd come back. But a chip and a hug, I don't want you to touch me, you know. My friend Eileen W. came to AA. She said she, she was going, help me, you know. That's exactly how I was. Please, I need your help, but not that help. Um, keep your hands off of me. And, um, and so I came back the next week, and Debbie got her chip and a hug, and 30 days, and everybody cried, you know, because everybody has to cry because they're all from the rehab, and they're all weeping, and they're all, you know, spinning their wristbands. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm feeling less than because I don't have a wristband. Is that weird or sick or what? And uh, then the following week, I came back because Debbie got drunk at 32 days. And it scared me half to death because I thought my first reaction was, she's left me here. She brought me to AA, and now I'm stuck in AA. And, and, it, and I, the reason I felt like I was stuck in AA, and I didn't realize this till I didn't realize it at the time. And nothing I'm telling you I, did I ever realize in real time. But I thought I'd been stuck here because I knew in here that I could not go back to what I was doing. But I didn't know what to do. And they kept saying, get a sponsor. Well, no, I'm not going to get a sponsor. What do I need a sponsor for? Well, he'll walk you through the big book. Oh, really? This really deep metaphysical text? I've got a degree in journalism and a minor in English. I've parsed some of the finest poetry in the English language. I don't know if I need somebody to help me unpack the jaywalker analogy. You know? Um, or, you know, help me polish off the finer points of gee, ma, ain't it grand, the wind stopped blowing. King alcohol and the denizens of his mad rum. Boogie, 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 boogie. Um, and... I only say this, I say this not to be disrespectful, but that was the attitude I came into AA with. I don't need this stuff. I'm too smart for this stuff. I can't surrender. This is a, bu- this is a bunch of bohunks walking around whistling in the dark. They're, they had drinking problems, and th- their problem is solved because of the simplicity of this. It's perfect for simple people, but not complicated people like me. I'm too complicated for this. I can't give in to this because it's just too stupid. Those steps are ridiculous. I'm, I took them every meeting I went to. I sat there going, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, can you believe? Yeah, okay, I believe. Uh, turn my will in my life? Yeah, here. Uh, uh, searching and fearless moral inventory. Yeah, I did a few things bad. I'm sorry. Um, Tick, 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 tick. What is the big deal? And then I started to have what we understand is those moments where I started to feel the alcoholism getting stronger than the effect and the influence of people's recovery on me. And it scared the life out of me. And I didn't know what to do. And a guy named Keith Carpenter spoke at our at the Sunday night meeting. And, uh, and I heard now in this Sunday night meeting, I heard some great speakers. Chuck C., I heard him when I was 21 days sober, you know, and I didn't think I was even an alcoholic. And there's Chuck, and I didn't understand a word he said, you know, because he was, he, I think you have to have a little experience to be really able to enjoy Chuck and, and get it, but he was so loving and he was so kind, and they made me go thank him, you know, get up in line and thank him. I thought, I didn't even understand what he said, why did I thank him, you know, thank you for saying things I didn't get anything out of, you know, but, um, so I go up to thank him, and, and Chuck was such a sweet, radiant man, and I get up to him, and I'm like the third from the end of the line. Uh, and I go up and I said, thank you for, for talking. And, and Chuck said, how long are you sober? And I said, I don't know, about 20 days. And he goes, oh, God, I love you, boy. And he put his arms around me and he kissed me. And that's where I caught alcoholism from Chuck Chamberlain. <laughs> he caught me right on the corner of the mouth. If I just turn my cheek, if I just turn my cheek, I'd be drunk with the rodeo guys. Uh, <laughs> Chuck was a sweet, lovely man, and, and uh, man, 
I, I was lucky to have his influence in my life. And then Keith Carpenter spoke, and he, and he, he asked me, uh, where do you go to meetings? I said, I go to this one. And really, how many meetings do you go to? I said, four. He goes, well, you should be going to more than four a week. And I said, no, I go to four a month. <laughs> and um, he said, you should be going to a meeting every night. How, how often did you drink? And I said, well, every night. He said, well, that's how many meetings you need to get to. I'll tell you what, where do you work? And I said, I work in Santa Monica. I'm living in Orange County, which is about 50 miles away. And he goes, uh, here's, here's the address of our Wednesday night meeting. Why don't you come to that meeting? He's doing a 12-step call. As fast as, as fast as 12-step call as I've ever seen. Oh, okay, thanks. So I go to the meeting and get there you know, at 828 because it's an 830 meeting. About 280 people in the room. It was much smaller then than it is now. And uh, I go in there, and I'm looking around for Keith, and I see him. And I go up and say hi, and he acts like he doesn't even know me. Oh, hi, kid. You know, he walks away. So I go sit down in the back row. I'm all the way in the back. And, and uh, at the break, this woman sitting next to me, this little black lady named Alice. I'm Alice. And Alice was really tough and scary. And she said, uh, what's your name? And I told her. And she goes, how long are you sober? And I said, I'm sober for uh, uh, 45 days. And that, she didn't like that because she was sober like 32 days. So she kind of glared at me. Really? You got a sponsor? And I said, no, I don't have a sponsor. And she said, well, you better get you one. Noted. <laughs> and she said, where do you go to meetings? And I said, I go to a meeting on Sunday night. She goes, you go to Pacific Group meetings? And I go, no. And she goes, got anything to write on? And I gave her a deposit slip for my checkbook because there's a fat chance I was going to be doing much with that soon. And uh, <laughs> she took out this rapidograph pen, and in the tiniest print, in the thinnest line, she, she asked me where I worked, and I told her. She wrote directions to every single meeting of the Pacific Group from the driveway of, my, of Santa Monica College Bookstore. You get to the edge of the driveway on Wednesday, and you turn left. And you go down to 20th Street and you make a left again. And, you, and, it, and she's writing this down, left again. And, she had, and I kept that thing in my wallet for months until it was just falling apart. And I would take that. And the next night I, I realized there was a meeting at this savings and loans. So I go there on a Thursday night and uh, I get in there. and Not even in there for a minute and a half. And here, the, the crowd parts and here comes Alice. You know. And she's wild. She's having, she was telling me about her Vietnam flashbacks. And she'd never been to Vietnam. <laughs> Seriously. And so she's up to, you know, how you doing? Fine. Uh, you got a sponsor? I said, no. You better get you one. Uh, yeah, I'll get me one. Sure. Uh, noted. And, um, and then Friday was the men's stag, so I was certain to be kind of relieved of Alice for a night. And, uh, and then I went to the Saturday night meeting, and there's Alice. You know, Alice was there every night. You know, you got a sponsor yet? No, I don't have a sponsor yet, Alice. We well, got to get you one. And then other people would say, you got a sponsor? You know, I just was sick of hearing it because I don't need a sponsor. I've got a degree in journalism. <laughs> that may seem funny to you. It seemed perfectly logical to me. I've been schooled. I'm educated. I'm not like you. I'm different. I drink because it makes me feel like a human being for a change. Obviously, you drink because you got nothing else to do. But I got the big picture, and I got to follow through on the big picture, and I got to drink to get into the big picture. And you guys drink for whatever your reason is, but I've got a motive, you know. But I can't do it anymore because I'm still peeing a little blood and um, <laughs> stuffing Kleenex in my underwear. How cool is that, you know? And uh, then they go, "You're only as sick as your secrets." And I shut up. <laughs> but um, so. So then I, I'm driving to work on Monday, and I'm on the freeway, and I get into an accident. I, the car in front of me just stopped, and, every, and I slammed my brakes on, and this old VW, I went, and went like this, stopped. I thought, oh, my God, maybe there is a God. Thank you. And I look in the rearview mirror, and the guy behind me in a pickup truck is talking to the person next to him. <laughs> I went, oh, no, and call, boom, I got accordion right between these two cars. And I get out of the car, and nobody speaks English. Nobody's talking English. And I'm standing there on the side of the road, 50 days sober, ready for tears, and thinking, this, this is bull. I'm not going back. I'm never going back. I, don't, I can't do this. I'm on the side of the 405 freeway at 730 in the morning, just ready to burst into tears. I had no one to call. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know what to say. 
And I look up, and of course, traffic slows down in L.A. for an accident or a guy changing his tire. Hey, look at that. And uh, (laughs) the traffic had slowed down, and as it crawls by, I look at one car, and there's Alice in the car. (laughs) And I got a sponsor that night. And that guy sponsored me for 26 years. Um, that man saved me. He saved my life. He sat me down and he said to me the first time we met, he said, um, are you willing to do anything to stay sober? And I said, yes, I meant it. And he said, that's really good because I want you to get a haircut, sh- trim your hair and shave that mustache off. And I'll see you on Thursday or Friday. And I said, what? And he said... I'm sorry, didn't you just say you were willing to do anything to stay sober? And I said, yeah. And he said, I just asked you to shave your mustache off, right? And I said, yeah. You know, I had your big book, but I didn't see any chapter to the barber in there. (laughs) And, um, And he said... I said, yeah, and he said, I said, but where is it in the big, and he said, it's not in the big book, and I said, well, where, what in AA, and he goes, it's not a part of AA, and he goes, I can see you're confused, normally I don't explain directions when I give them, but tonight I'm feeling kind of generous, I'm going to give you a freebie, sport, (laughs) you just said you were willing to do anything to stay sober, correct, and I said, yeah, and I just asked you to shave, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, if you're not willing to shave that mustache just because I asked you to do it, what makes me think that you're going to be able to do the steps when I ask you to do them? I just want to see if you're willing because I don't want to waste time on a loser. So I'll see you Friday. He got up and left. You know, and I, I thought, this is, I don't, no, 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 no. Am I not? He's a milkman. I don't do this for a milkman. I didn't shave for two days, and I knew I wouldn't see him. I wanted to sweat him a little bit, you know. And, uh, and then the third day, I got up in the morning, and I looked in the mirror, and I thought, if I fight one more thing, I'm not going to make it. It just occurred to me. It, didn't, it wasn't like a, my decision. I just thought, if I fight it anymore, I'm not going to make it. And I shaved that mustache off. I had that for 15 years. I had that mustache. Shaved it off and uh, went to the meeting that night. And there was Bill. And he came shooting through across the room, and he put his arm around me and said, here we go. Bill walked me through everything. I mean, he walked me through the divorce. He walked me through job crises. He 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 did the twelve step call that that we're asked to do. I he, I got my first twelve step call from a guy named Radcliffe, who uh, called me. I'd given him my number because I got in the habit of giving people my number, even though I know they were giving my number away at other meetings. Uh, and uh, I gave it to him and at a meeting. Cause I'm, there's one way that you can be sure that no newcomers will ever bother you, and that's give them your phone number. That pretty well ends the conversation, you know. Oh, here, call me tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I will. No, never call you. He called me. Charlie, can you meet me? It's like noon, you know. What, what, Radcliffe? Yeah, I need you to. I need to talk to somebody. I'm going crazy. I really need some help. I said, okay, where are you? you know, I'm Bob's big boy over in Santa Monica Boulevard. So I go over there and I sit down. I call my sponsor. I said, what do I do, Bill? What do I tell him? I'm six months sober. What do I tell him? He goes, you got nothing to tell him. <laughs> you don't know anything yet. Just go there and listen to him and let him know that you care. That's all you can do. I'll give you the next direction tonight when I see you at the meeting. Click. So I go meet this guy. And I'm sitting at the table and I said, so, how you doing? And this guy is, it's, it's this time of year and he's sweating. I mean, sweating through his shirt in this place. And his upper lip, he had a big upper lip and it was beads of sweat all over. And he goes, I just don't know. Uh, uh, I, I have a guru in New York and I, I may be going back to New York to see my guru. And I'm trying to figure out what it is about love. and What love means because I need to find out the meaning of love. And I need to understand what love is and this and that. And I said, I'm thinking, what did Bill tell me to do? Ask him how he got to AA. How did you get to AA? He eventually paused. Um, I was trying to get all the silverware to my side of the table while he was talking. You know? I said, well, what's that over there? And uh, And I said, um, how did you get to AA? Just a friendly question. And he said, um, the SWAT team. (laughs) Whoa, whoa. Really? I need to hear this. Now, I'm not going to tell him Debbie brought me, you know. Uh, (laughs) 
how did the SWAT team bring you? He said, well, I was drunk the other night. And I was living in a, I'm living in a motel on Santa Monica Boulevard, and I got drunk, and I got loud, and I started, I was in a blackout, and I was yelling, and I told people I had a gun, and I was going to kill people, and they leave me alone, and my roommate, my roommate called the police, and I came out of the blackout, and the cop had his boot on my neck and a shotgun against my head, and he cocked the shotgun, and he said, if you move, I'm going to blow your head off. And I went, Damn! <laughs> I I love this guy. <laughs> and I said, and? And he said, and he said something that stuck with me the rest of all, the rest of my life. He said, I don't know if I belong in AA. I don't know if I'm going to fit there. And I said, just based on our conversation. Why don't you give it a little trial time and see if maybe you don't fit in? And and he went, and I, I was kind of working with him for like three days, you know, recalling him, you know, and talk, taking his phone calls and talking to him. He'd go to the meetings. And I, and I was kind of, I was getting kind of, you know, hey, yeah, I, I, I brought, I shepherded this young man back into the flock. And now I'm going to get my first taste of sponsorship. You got a sponsor yet, Radcliffe? And he said, yeah, I did tonight. Who? I asked Jim C. over there, Jim C., you know, but he got exactly who he was supposed to have because he's still sober. He's 29 years sober, married, productive life from being dragged out of a out of a hotel room by the SWAT team. So it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter how you get here. It doesn't matter if you get dragged out by the SWAT team or you or Debbie brings you. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. I've had. We, we don't get as many 12-step calls as we used to get because of the... In, there are a lot of influences. I don't even go into them. It's sort of an outside issue, really. But we have to be ready. I have to be ready for people that are new coming in here who don't have insurance, maybe, or don't have a, who are coming in here drunk off the street. I, but it got so rare back in the 90s. I mean, it was like you never saw a newcomer at a meeting. They all had 30 or 40 days. A woman came up to me when I was secretary of my home group one night, and she said, Charlie... The man next to me has been drinking. And I said, let me handle this. <laughs> we don't want that element creeping into our AA meeting. <laughs> A drunk guy at our meeting? I don't think so. Uh, release the dogs, you know. And um, no, I mean, it was alarming to her that there was a drunk guy at an AA meeting because everybody who came in looked freshly powdered and he was a drunk guy and, uh, and he wet his seat. And, and you know what happened? He wet his seat and he started to cry. And a guy named Don in my group ran up and said, and I, I was going, okay, I got to get the seat. And Don said, let me take care of this. And Don walked over, helped the guy up, walked him to the restroom, got him paper towels. Don came out and cleaned the seat put it away, got him a fresh seat, sat him down, put him down in the seat. You know, that's a 12-step call. That's a 12-step call. That's not knowing anything about the program. That's knowing that someone is suffering just like you were. Someone suffers just like I do, and I I look for them. That's how how I do my 12-step work now, is I go through my meeting, and I try try to do three things for somebody when when I see them in a meeting, and that's walk up and say, hi, I haven't seen you here before. And I ask them their name because that's what people did for me. And I'll tell you something. If you remember a newcomer's name after they've been around about four times, they are completely amazed and they think that you are like a magician. That you, When you go up and say, hi, Don, and they go, you remember my name? Well, yeah, I remember you. You, know, you were the only new guy that had two days that I talked to last week. I know everybody else in the group and I didn't know you. Now I know your name. You know, They think it's magic that you know their name off the, out of all these people, and um, and I also try to I I tell them, did you get a seat yet? Go get yourself a seat. Let me go down with you, and we'll find a seat. And get close to the front because there's less dist- fewer distractions up there. And we'll get you toward the front, and those are those are the really good seats. So you want to sure you come with me? I'll show you. I'll, you know, and go down and get them a good seat, and then tell them where the bathroom is, and tell them where the coffee table is, and tell them we'll see you at the break. You don't have to tell them anything about AA. He's going to pick that up from the vibe in the room. All he wants to know is that he's welcome there. All he wants to know is that if he wets the seat, somebody will take care of him. 
That's all he wants to know. That they won't go, Jesus Christ, did you piss that seat? Get out! Nobody does that in AA. The more, in fact, they're, they're kind. People almost clamor to help, you know, to, to help somebody who's really sick. And um, I didn't get the hardcore sit down and shut up, pull the cotton out of your ears and stuff it in your mouth, your, your dirt ball. I never got that when I came to AA. I got the kind of example of 12-step work where people did exactly that with me. You got a seat? Good to see you back. You have a commitment here? You know, my sponsor, had, by that time, my sponsor told me to get commitments at all my meetings and to be useful. And I started taking the steps, although I didn't know I was taking them. And Bill said, get to meetings an hour early. Get a commitment at your meetings. Call me every day. Talk to God. Get on your knees and talk to God. Well, I don't want to talk to God. I'm, I'm an agnostic. I'm too smart for God. I believe there is a God, but I believe God is with good people. And I have no time for somebody who's got people hovering around him to, to touch the hem of his garment. You know, uh, when he, and I didn't, forgot about that, but, um, <laughs> I don't need a God who is in his perfect room with all the people who keep gloves in their glove box. You know, the people who do everything right. Um, I don't need that kind of God. And he, and I'll tell you something else. I've done some shameful things that I cannot be forgiven for. And I have. And I swore that. So I just need, if God just stays there and I get over here, maybe if I get through life without causing too much more trouble, then he won't condemn me. That was my view of God, that there was this hateful, angry person. And my sponsor said, do clean up commitments, clean the ashtrays. Do you have to clean up? You want me to get clean up? He knew why. He wanted me to get something that has absolutely no gloss to it. You're just there, you're a guy with a mop. You're a guy with a broom. You're a guy cleaning out the coffee pot. You're a guy cleaning the ashtrays. Excuse me. And uh, and I did that. I did that for months. Months! And I didn't have a spiritual awakening. And I want a spiritual awakening. Oh, I had lots of friends. I've been sober for eight months. But I want an awakening. I want to be awakened. I want God's contact. And he said, well, do you pray every morning? Well, yeah, okay. So I pray. And my prayer went something like this. God, uh, I know you're there. Um, help me be useful today. Help me see what I can do for you. And be really obvious. Because if you're not, I will miss it. I will miss it. I don't get subtle. I don't get the still small voice. I need a... And if I get a spiritual awakening, please make it really clear that I'm having one. Because I won't know if you don't. I don't need the quiet little pat on the shoulder or the little knowledge that comes eight months later. I need a pick me up by the lapel, shake me, who's your daddy kind of awakening. Wake, you know, where I know, I know. And I didn't get it. I was going eight months, I couldn't get it. And I'm doing everything he told me. I'm praying to God every day. I'm talking to him at night. I'm doing the steps. I thought I was. I didn't know I was. I Actually, I thought, when are we going to do the first three steps? Because I want to do the first three steps. I'm going to work them. I'm going to work these things. I'm going to get down there, you know, spot me. I'm doing three. Okay, here we go. I thought it meant something like getting the cross-training clothes to do. Because I heard people say, you've got to work the steps. You've got to do the work. It'll work. And I thought, well, I'm not doing the work. I'm just doing these dumb commitments. I'm cleaning up after people. I'm I'm getting to meetings early. I'm praying to God. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I don't believe this crap. And then I do it, I'm doing it all. And I go to an afternoon meeting. And this girl comes in. And she stands at the podium. And she starts crying. And she goes, I, I haven't had a drink in seven months. <laughs> but I haven't been to a meeting in seven months. But I came back today. And I had a spiritual awakening. You have got to be putting me on. I'm emptying the ashtrays, cleaning the ashtrays, dumping the coffee pots, mopping the floors, talking to newcomers, praying to God. Nothing. This bitch comes back five hours. And all of a sudden, she's God's BFF. No, no, I do not accept this. I do not accept this. So I talked to Bill. I said, when am I going to do the steps and when am I going to have a spiritual awakening? He goes, what are you talking about? First of all, how do I know when you're going to have a spiritual awakening? I don't know. 
Maybe you'll never have one. What? He said, I just said that to mess with you. Just, uh, um, maybe you'll never have one. But you've got to keep doing this. Because it's keeping you sober. You're sober eight months now. Something's happening. You just haven't had something that you can put your finger on. Great. You know, I'm asking people their names. You, know, you go up every night at the meetings. Hi, what's your name? I'm Charlie. Hi. Yeah, I know, Charlie. You introduced yourself a couple of minutes ago. But nobody, but nobody ever said, hey, I already told you my name. You know, nobody ever yanked their hand away or got irritated. I was asking them their name again. And I go around. I thank everybody. I didn't sit in my seat till the gavels began. The gavel came up. And I just uh, I did everything he asked me to do. And I wasn't going to have a spiritual awakening. And uh, he said, I don't know when it's going to happen for you. And I said, well, then when are we going to start doing the steps? And he said, are you calling me every day? Yeah. You go to your meetings every night because I see you there, right? Yeah. He said, do you like going to meetings every single night? I said, not really. There's some nights I'd like to stay home and watch TV or something. I don't have a TV, but if I had one, I'd like to watch it. <laughs> he said, um, you're, you're praying every morning? I said, I pray every morning and I pray every night. And uh, you're, thank, you're talking to people at the meeting and you're going out for coffee with people after the meetings. So the fellowship extends out. You're going to a book study. You're studying the big book. You know, you're doing, you're doing all that stuff. He said, what part of the first three steps do you think you're not doing? Because it's a lot more than theory, sport. And I had to think about it. And he had put me into action before I even knew I was doing the steps. He said, while we're at it, here's your inventory stuff. Get to it. You know, and I, but uh, I thought, okay, so I, all right, I'm doing the steps, I guess. I guess mopping the floor is real spiritual, right? That's God's, I'm doing God's work. You know, and, uh, God, just one night I was mopping the floor at Ohio Street. Frank was there. Frank and I got sober within about six. He's got about six months on me. And I'm standing there mopping the floor after the meeting. And I stood there and the, I'm leaning on the mop. And the speaker is, people are lined up to thank the speaker. And I looked at these people, just like I'm looking at you right now. And my, my eyes went across every one of their faces. And it occurred to me in here that I knew every single one of those people by name. And I liked them. I liked him. This is a guy who didn't like anything when he came in here. And I liked these people. And, I, and further than that, it occurred to me if I could be lifted out of this experience and put anywhere else like on earth that I wanted to go, like a free flyer trip to Hawaii or wherever I wanted to go, I wouldn't want to be any place else than stand in here with this mop right now in this moment. And thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was there, and I was sober. And it never has changed since then. That when I ask, when I when I ask when I'm going to get mine, it gets turned around on me that when are you going to give something? Because when you give something, you might get something, you might not. There's no quid pro quo with God. But what happened was I came into AA with a God of my expectations, and what I discovered here by doing by following the example of people who are 12-stepping me with their example and their kindness and their obvious actions and contributions to AA, like you've seen at this podium every day and night this week. And these people save my soul, you know, and I have to give that back. And I give that back in areas of my life that aren't AA-related. I go to work and I do that. I go, I try to do like what, what Sheldon said. I go to work and I try to be useful. I got, I was in a, Steve and I were talking about this earlier. I was 55 years old. Life was going, you know, life goes really good sometimes when you're sober a while. Things are going fine. And I was, I had gotten a job as a teacher. I became a teacher for a while. And then, have, you know, seven years into that job, I got a chance to write cartoons for a movie studio. Too long a story to explain how that happened, but it happened. And I wound up, I went to my sponsor and said, what do I do? And he goes, take the job. He said, you already know how to teach now. Go take that job. So I go back and ask my kids what I should do, my students. And they said, take the job. You know? And um, so I did. And I worked at the studio for 16 years. And I, and they, they, I went all over the world. They, they sent me everywhere. And I wound up doing seminars for them. And um, I'd go to you know, Asia and Europe. All I'm not tooting my own horn on this. I'm just telling you, I was so, it was so odd for a guy like me who was living in his mom's house, peeing blood and having no friends and being afraid of the world, to go out there and be with people and be a contributing part of this business that I was doing. And I'd go to AA meetings in Hong Kong and in, in Scotland, where I didn't understand a word they said. 
might as well have been Hong Kong, and, um, and, and had people who were kind there who would walk, you know, who would do a 12-step call on me there, and it was wonderful. And uh, at 16 years of being with that company, they called me into a room one morning, and I got laid off. I was 55 years old. They aren't exactly clamoring for 55-year-old men uh, on, in the workforce, but uh, I wound up going out of there, and I left with, I left on a cordial note because I didn't take it personally. It, it broke my heart because I really didn't know what I was going to do because I worked for somebody all my life, and I panicked. And I got these two children, and I'm in the middle of a divorce, one of the most brutal divorces, and uh, and so I just couldn't, you know, I didn't know what to do, and I call. I remember, I can't, last time I was here, Vince and Pat Yo were here. I love Vince Yo. I love Pat especially, but I, I really loved Vince. And Vince was very kind to me, and Vince played 12-step calls on me all the time. And Vince uh, and Pat were here, and, um, you know, we drove home with them because they couldn't, didn't want to fly out because they had to get home early. So he, they rode with my wife and I. And my wife, by the way, I'm on my third wife now, and she's the most wonderful human being I know in AA. She's 18 years sober. She's home with my children right now. She allowed me to come here and be with you, and she would take care of my kids, who are now 12 and, and almost 11. And uh, and she oh, she didn't like it. I mean, she pulled up at the airport, and she said, what are you talking about this weekend? And I said, the 12th step. And she goes, oh, practice these principles in some of your affairs? Um, and then she laughed and drove off, you know. Um, she adores me. She's uh, She's the best thing that ever happened to me, trust me. And the best thing that happened to my children too, because they treat her like their mother. They treat her like a mother, and she ador- she loves them, and she's kind to them, and she's also strict with them too. And she's a good stepmom. And so, um, anyway, uh, Vince and Pat and, I, and Louise and I drove home, and uh, we had the best time. We laughed the whole way. We laughed the whole weekend, just like you guys are doing with each other, laughing and having a great time. We met for breakfast in the morning. And on all the way home, we had laughs, and we stopped for lunch, and more laughs. And then we got them to the air, Ontario airport where their car was parked and parted company. And I saw, you know, we go to the same meetings, and then uh, about a month later, Vince died of a heart attack. And um, that really hurt because he died of a heart attack on a Tuesday. And that Wednesday, my sponsor of 26 years called me, and said, or 27 years called me and said, uh, I drank yesterday. He was 30, almost 34 years sober, and um, and he was he was in tears on the phone, and he said, "Don't throw me away, please, don't throw me away." And I thought, you know what? I would never throw this man away, ever, ever. But it was such a, it just crushed me, and I didn't know what to do. And I I I, uh, I have a good friend named Bob R who lives up in Oxnard. He's 44 years sober, and I've been talking to Bob for a long time because Bill, my sponsor, had been kind of pulling back, not doing what he had been doing, and kind of getting out of the loop. And uh, so I called Bob after I got on the, off the phone with Bill and asked him if he would sponsor me. And he said absolutely. And so Bob, I've been walking with Bob the last few years, but. Um, we go through some wonderful times in sobriety like this weekend. We have laughs, but you can see, and you experience this the same way I did this weekend, of great joy on Saturday night, followed by a terrible tragedy to our speaker and uh, within an hour of, of finishing talking here. And yet she's going to be all right because she knows where to go and who to lean into. And though we can't stop her pain, we can't cushion it for her and love her. Because that's all she needs right now is someone to love her. And and for people to not try to tell her what to do, but to try to say, we're here. I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. You know, And that's what everybody's 12-step call has been to me. The people who have been kind to me, some of them have been dead, some of them died drunk. Some of the people that when I was brand new who gave me their cards and said, call them. One guy named Richard Barton called, said, call me. Call me tomorrow morning at one o'clock in the afternoon. I I got his card, you know. And I I the next day I I got showered and cleaned up by noon, and then sat by the phone with Richard's card, you know, and waited till the the second hand was coming up to one o'clock, and I started dialing it about twenty seconds before, and Richard answered the phone, you know, and and he was there when I called him, and he said I'll see you at the meeting tonight. That's all our conversation was, and then he left, and then he died a few years later of, of alcoholism. 
And a lot of guys, there have been a lot of guys that have done that who have practiced that 12 step, but they apparently forgot some of the things that our other speakers this weekend have spoken about who have, have uh, enriched my life immeasurably. I get to, I got to listen to all that stuff, all those talks and, and absorb them. And, and I, in the same way that I've absorbed my, my friends' actions and my friends' examples in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I hope if you are having trouble right now, and if your heart is breaking or you're feeling some distance from AA or you're just in, in a deep, in a valley like Ralph was talking about where you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you're on a, a kind of a, a little lift from this today, um, come back. Come back next year. But tomorrow night, come back to a meeting that's near you and go into the people in there and tell them your name and tell them that you might be hurting a little bit. And is there anybody you didn't hear new that you may need to hear that there's hope even though you're hurting? Because that's when I find my best times is when I'm going through something bad, going up to somebody who's got it. I take one look at somebody who's new and know I haven't got it that bad, you know. When they've got that look like all the lights are out and everybody's home, you know that look. Um, those are the people I lean to. Those are the Radcliffs of the world. And uh, uh, thank you for having me this weekend. Thank you for your graciousness and kindness. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.